My name is Sam Vaknin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. Abusers emit subtle, almost subliminal, signals in their body language. But these are observable and discernible. Learn to read the abuser's body language, and serve yourself a world of trouble and of hurt. The first sign is a haughty, arrogant body language. The abuser adopts a physical posture, which implies and exudes an air of superiority, seniority, hidden powers, mysteriousness, amused indifference. Though the abuser usually maintains sustained and piercing eye contact, he often refrains from physical proximity. He keeps a personal territory around him. Abusers take part in social interactions, even mere banter, but they do so condescendingly, from a position of supremacy and for magnanimity and largesse. Even when the abuser feigns gregariousness, he rarely mingles socially. He prefers to remain the observer or the lone wolf. The second sign is entitlement marker. Abusers immediately ask for special treatment. They don't want to wait their turn. They want to have a longer or shorter therapeutic session. They want to talk directly to authority figures and not to assistants or secretaries. They want to be granted special payment terms. They want to enjoy custom-tailored arrangements. This goes well with the abuser's alloplastic defenses, his tendency to shift responsibility to others or to the world at large for his own needs, failures, behavior, ch choices, mishaps, mistakes. The sentence most beloved on abusers is, look what you made me do. The abuser is the one who vocally and dem in a demonstratively demands the undivided attention of the head waiter in a restaurant, or monopolizes the hostess, or latches on to celebrities in a party. The abuser reacts with rage and indignantly when denied his wishes, and when treated the same as others whom he always deems inferior. Abusers frequently and embarrassingly dress down service providers, such as cab drivers. The next sign is idealization followed by devaluation. Abusers instantly idealize or devalue their interlocutors. They flatter, adore, admire, and applaud the target in an embarrassingly exaggerated and profuse manner, or, when rebuffed, they sulk, they abuse and humiliate her. Abuses are polite only in the presence of a potential would-be victim, a mate, a collaborator, in other words, a source of narcissistic supply. But they are unable to sustain even perfunctory civility, and very fast deteriorate to barbs and thinly veiled hostility to verbal or other violent displays of abuse, rage attacks, or cold detachment, or to sadistic humor. Then there is the membership posture. Abusers always try to belong, yet at the very same time the abuser maintains his stance as an outsider. The abuser seeks to be admired for his ability to integrate and ingratiate himself, but without investing the efforts which are commensurate with such undertaking. For instance, if the abuser talks to a psychologist or a therapist, the abuser first states emphatically that he never studied psychology, but then he proceeds to make seemingly effortless use of obscure professional terms, thus demonstrating that he mastered the discipline all the same, and this is supposed to prove that he is exceptionally, exceptionally intelligent or introspective, in other words, superior. In general, abusers always prefer show-off to substance. One of the most effective methods of exposing an abuser is by trying to delve deeper. The abuser is shallow. He is a pond pretending to be an ocean. He likes to think of himself as a renaissance man, 
a jack of all trades, or a genius. Abusers never admit to ignorance or to failure in any field. Yet typically, they are ignorant and they are losers. It is surprisingly easy to penetrate the gloss and the veneer of the abuser's self-proclaimed omniscience, success, wealth, and omnipotence. Abusers brag and boast. They do so incessantly. An abuser's speech is peppered with I, my, myself, and mine. This is called pronoun density. Abusers describe themselves as intelligent or rich or modest or intuitive or creative, but always excessively, always implausibly, always extraordinarily so. The abuser's biography sounds unusually rich and complex. His achievements are incommensurate with his age, with his education, or with his renown. Yet his actual condition is evidently and demonstrably incompatible with his claims. Very often the abuser's lives or fantasies are easily discernible. He always name drops and appropriates other people's experiences and accomplishments as his own. Abusers use emotion-free language. They like to talk about themselves and only about themselves. If the abuser is not interested in others or in what they have to say, he shows it. He is never reciprocal. He acts disdainful, even angry, if he feels an intrusion on his precious time. In general, abusers are very impatient, are easily bored, with strong attention deficits. Unless and until they become the topic of discussion. One can dissect all aspects of the intimate life of the abuser, providing the discourse is not emotionally tinted. If asked to relate directly to his emotion, the abuser intellectualizes, rationalizes, speaks about himself in the third person and in a detached scientific tone, or composes a narrative with a fictitious character in it, suspiciously autobiographical. Most abusers get enraged when required to delve deeper into their motives, fears, hopes, wishes and needs. They use violence to cover up their perceived weakness and sentimentality. They distance themselves from their own emotions and from their loved ones by alienating and hurting them. Finally, abusers are serious. They are dead serious about themselves. The abuser may possess a fabulous sense of humor, scathing and cynical, but rarely is he self-deprecating. The abuser regards himself as being on a constant mission, whose importance is cosmic and whose consequences are global. If the abuser is a scientist, he is always in the throes of revolutionizing science. If he is a journalist, he is in the middle of the greatest story ever. If he is an aspiring businessman, he is on the way to concluding the deal of the century. Woe betide those who doubt his grandiose fantasies and impossible schemes and claims. This self-misperception is not amenable to light-headedness or self-effacement. The abuser is easily hurt and insulted. Even the most innocuous remark or act are interpreted by the abuser as belittling, intruding or coercive slights and demands. The abuser's time is more valuable than other people's. Therefore, it cannot be wasted on unimportant matters, such as social intercourse, family obligations, or household chores. Inevitably, the abuser feels constantly misunderstood and underestimated. Any suggested help, advice, or concerned inquiry are immediately cast by the abuser as intentional humiliation, implying that the abuser is in need of help and counsel and therefore imperfect. Any attempt to set an agenda is to the abuser an intimidating act of enslavement. In this sense, the abuser is both schizoid, avoids company, and paranoid. Abusers are sometimes sadistic, and they have inappropriate effect. In other words, they find the obnoxious, the heinous, the shocking, funny, or even gratifying. They are sexually sadomasochistic, or deviant, or autoerotic. They like to taunt, to torment, and to hurt people, people's feelings. They, are, they do it sometimes humorously, or with bursting honesty, but it's still sadistic. 
While some abusers are stable and conventional, others are, are antisocial, and their impulse control is flawed. They are very reckless, self-destructive, self-defeating, and just plain destructive. They engage in workaholism, alcoholism, drug abuse, pathological gambling, compulsory shopping, or reckless driving. Yet these, the lack of empathy, the aloofness, the disdain, the sense of entitlement, the restricted application of humor, the unequal treatment, the sadism, and the paranoia, do not render the abuser a social misfit. This is because the abuser mistreats only his closest, his nearest, and supposedly dearest. He abuses his spouse, his children, or more rarely colleagues, friends, and neighbors. To the rest of the world, those who don't know him intimately, the abuser appears to be composed, rational, and functioning. Abusers are very adept at casting a veil of secrecy, often with the active aid of their victims, over their dysfunction and misbehavior. They are great actors, and they succeed in deceiving the entire world, all people, all the time.